Good morning, Dr. Pran Yoganathan. Hopefully I got your name right, but um, great to chat to you today, mate. How you doing? Beautifully said, mate. Yeah, call me Pran, mate, and thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> Yoga Nathan. I think I worked that out. But, uh, uh, beautifully yeah, done. Yeah. I won't give you the full version. We'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's, your full, uh, what's the full version of Pran? Uh, it's, it's not too bad. Like, as, as Tamil, sometimes we carry middle names and stuff, but, but, but my first name is Pranavan. Yep. And it's Yoganathan, so a preferred, uh, preferred brand, much easier. Uh, uh, I use the Bogan version, Yoganathan, <laughs> let's say. But um, so you're, um, you're you're Sri Lankan via New Zealand, studied medicine in uh, University of Otago and then um, Sydney. So is that right? Yeah. Uh, look, it's been a been an interesting life, uh, Marty. Uh, we left Sri Lanka very early on in the piece because of the civil war there. And I, a lot of my life was spent in Africa, actually. Wow. Both in, yeah, Nigeria and, and Zimbabwe. We ended up in New Zealand maybe when I was about 10, 11. <laughs> um, trained there, did all my study there and came over to Sydney, Australia as a junior doctor age 21. And cool. I've been there since I'm 40 now. So uh, approaching nearly 20 years here in Australia. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, thanks for coming on. I um, uh, I first came across you with your cool Instagram page. Um, somebody mentioned that you'd shared one of my pictures and I checked it out and had a bit of an interaction and I started following you and I thought, this guy's hilarious. Um, so I just wanted to troll through your Instagram page and my favourite highlights and um, get the extended caption discussion version, if that's okay. Absolutely. Go for it, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? They can um, drop a comment or a question. We can touch on them later. But um, yeah, so I suppose that the first thing you're a, you're a real life uh, gastroenterologist and uh, consultant doctor in Sydney, working around the hospitals and with a private practice. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right, Marty. So we um, to enter the field of gastroenterology, we we study internal medicine. So we're all. Uh, physicians. I've uh, been a gastroenterologist now for going on 10 years. The training takes over three years, so probably up to 13 or 14 now years uh, in this field. Um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting field. And uh, what I like about it, uh, and you, you'll probably relate um, as an engineer, is just the objectivity. If there's a problem, we can we can see it. Um, do you know what I mean? We've got a fiber optic camera and we can see it. We can, we can remove it. And, and, and um, I like that. You know, I like to be able to um, to see the pathology that I'm dealing with. Yeah, an in interesting gig. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think you said your Instagram is, is taking the piss of uh, it was how you phrased it, but um, you're not the normal doctor. And um, I, so why, why Instagram? When, when did you realise you had a gift for um, sarcastic, thought-provoking, uh, interesting <laughs> memes? <laughs> I'm so jealous. It's three thousand yeah. words that nobody reads, but you write. You, you you distill it into this, you know, one meme that make everybody crack up and um, get the point across. So yeah, um, tell us about your Insta and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, look, um, it, it, uh, the sarcasm. Well, that's a lifelong talent. <laughs> my wife never appreciates my, my gift of circus. <laughs> <That, that, laughs> Maybe that, you're using it to, to get yours yeah. out. Well, Instagram and Facebook, they're, they're, they're interesting mediums because you can sort of, um, you can compress a lot of your thoughts into obviously something visual which people tend to pick up on. Additionally, you can insert a fair bit of a, a body of text in uh, Twitter. I found mm -hmm. fascinating, um, uh, but but the problem with it is that that uh, there's just a limit to how much you can you can write. And a lot of my a lot of my slides are accompanied by fairly wordy um, breakdowns of what my perspective on it, and and so I just fell into it. I, I, I remember um, a year and year and a bit ago, I I, I didn't I didn't have an Instagram or a work Facebook account, but. It's a it's a new world, Marty, and and you know the problem with medicine. It's always been a very insular field where, mm. as a as a consumer of medicine or healthcare, you can't see in um in, in, into our world. So mm. I, I think in the in the in the name of transparency, I, I, I'd love to keep the doors open and just let people in, um and and so they can have a look around and and unfortunately, what we've got 
within these doors is uh, a fairly disjointed, broken system. Um, and I think it's important that people realize that. Now, what I'm trying to do is trying to get people to take responsibility uh, for their own health. Yeah. And educating them and taking them on your journey. And um, so, so how do you create the memes? Do, do, do you, you just do them in Photoshop and, and line them up? And do, 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 do you just post them as you do them every day? I'm fascinated as somebody who's trying to publish and, and it's a big job. So I, I much respect for what you do on Insta. Oh, thank you, mate. Uh, my life, my entire life is a, is a, is a meme. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's how I look at it. Um, look, the pictures, the pictures just sort of come to mind. Uh, and then I just find it on Google and, uh, you know, I've got a little handy app called Canva. I don't know if you've heard of oh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use Canva for the rest of your books. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so I just use Canva to um, fire these memes off. Uh, like I'll, I'll try and do three or four, five posts a day, uh, mix yeah. it up with some scientific posts with with some that, that contain a little bit of humour. But I'm just used to it now. It's my sort of routine. And I'll do it if I've got a spare five minutes or if I'm yeah. at the gym and I'm resting between sets or something <laughs> like that, I'll, I'll fire it off very quickly. So I just, just find the time. And, and it's interesting, the more you do something, the quicker you become, the more yeah, efficient totally. you become at it. Totally. So, so how did you get to be um, so confident in a nutritional view that is somewhat, I mean, as you've dobbed yourself in with your memes, somewhat diametrically opposed to the, the the mainstream medical uh advice a lot of the time yeah um look it's a very i've always had an interest in in evolutionary biology Marty, and like in, a, in another life perhaps that that's something i would have pursued but you know i've got typically um bossy southeast asian parents who um, fought me to the field of medicine, you know, uh, you must do medicine. I've always been a mathematically um, gifted kid and, you know, that, that to me, medicine, uh, I struggle to make sense of it. Um, I find it very much to be a dogmatic practice which really doesn't focus on, on, on evidence per se. Um, and, and I've always taken the view that, that the preventative approach trumps um, the current disease model that we've got, and uh, putting all that together, I'm, I'm I guess I'm at unease. Uh, I'm uneasy in my in my situation, and yep. this is just a way of, sort of verbalizing it and, and 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 you know getting it out there. Yeah, yeah, and you've done all this research um, and formed your own very robust point of view. Listening to some of your other podcasts, you've um, got a very cohesive view, and that comes sometimes with the. Uh, research and understanding of logic and mathematics and you, you need a a world view that you know this moves that and a system sort of approach so i think we're uh definitely soulmates in that aspect and that's what i need i need something that lines up um and and, and this moves that so um speaking of levers um the the the, the first time we came across each other was when you shared this and we started interacting and i started following you and um I think I you shared it at a low carb Australia video that you did, and I pinged you and said, "Great to see people sharing this." You just said, "This needs to get out." That the protein leverage, um, I suppose, to give the background. I did a bunch of analysis from our optimizer data from people tracking in nutrient optimizer. Basically, found that the higher percentage of protein people eat. Um, the less they eat, the fewer calories they consume. So why why is this not a thing out there and why why has nobody discovered this and shouting it from the rooftops other than maybe University of Sydney, um, Robin Harman and, and Simpson with their protein leverage hypothesis, but even they're a little bit caged and, and, and limited in their discussion of it. So, yeah, what, why isn't this better known? That, that that slide that you I, I pull up my account sometimes in you know while I'm consulting with patients and I use the visual cues. I, I think I will show that to most people that there. Wow. Yeah. Um, so you know it is very very powerful data, Marty, and, and and the numbers that you guys had behind that data is huge. Uh, I'd like mm. to see anything, um, such as that has been done in the literature to that degree. Now. 
it, 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 it's well known, it's well known and the, and the literature reflects this, that, that these higher protein diets do lead to overall lower calorie consumption. The issue where I think medicine gets conf con confused is there is so much bias against animal protein, in particular with red meat. Mm. Uh, there's, there's this confusion. So a lot of these studies that, that go on to say higher protein diets lead to better satiety will then end it with this caveat, which is that but plant protein should be utilised rather than animal protein because it's like of the a cognitive dissonance between, you know, I believe this and being told this and the whole momentum of nutrition because it started back in like an Adventist institution effectively. Yes. Is, yes. Um, it's hard to rid nutrition of that overlay that plant-based is optimal or the best way um yeah, yeah. and you, you, you've definitely swung to the other extreme probably even more than me to a you know animal protein animal-based nutrition works best for most people and i suppose from a gastroenterology point of view you see a lower fiber diet help a lot of people so yeah anyway um we can get onto that more later but yeah for sure but um yeah you know it, it's the 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 medical literature is just awash with a lot of confused studies and 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 so i think fundamentally we, we within this field i think we're all confused and, and this is why i love that data that you've got because it's clean it's yeah. clean there's no there's no bias to it it's just a, a numbers yeah. guide pulling the numbers out and just yeah. demonstrating it very elegantly um so no thank you for doing that mate and every time we we put people through the master class and guide people to dial in getting adequate protein not i suppose to reiterate something i keep on having to go over again it's not eating more protein it's a higher percentage of protein by dialing back the fat and carbohydrate you don't just eat um more butter to get your protein it's about finding foods that have a higher percentage of protein and dialing back the the fat and carbs in your diet every time people follow that approach it just works magically it takes time to incrementally move up and you don't have to jump from 15 to 60 percent overnight and people fall off the wagon if they do that but if they just dial it up progressively it, it always seems to work so i i love this one that's so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and those memes just communicate so effectively oh they, they do the you get into way. your head without they bypass the uh that 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 filter because you, you're laughing and then you go oh, i get it and i have to agree with it rather than having to come back and argue so um I so. Could, you go, about is, could you go yeah. back to that slide the protein slide i just wanted to make a quick point a very yeah. interesting point um, uh, sorry, the, the one, your, your, your uh, nutrient yeah, optimized graph, yeah. So it's very interesting, I mean, like when you, when you consider us, and again, from an evolutionary perspective, as, a, as, a, as an ape that fundamentally learned to hunt and scavenge and so forth and, and, and introduce nutrient density in our food, the closest living primate um, that's related to us is, is the chimpanzees. It's very interesting, the chimpanzees have animal protein in their diet, they hunt. Mm. Um, but they do so very infrequently. Now, mm. their percentage of animal protein in their diet is about 10%, 6 to 10%, and, uh, which is very interesting that, that um, you, you know, they incorporate that. Now, you compare America with their obesity crisis, their, their consumption of protein primarily comes from plants, mm. uh, you know, and their consumption of animal protein, whilst they made out to be big meat consumers, is actually very low. Um, you know, some some places it's as low as fifteen percent, um, which I'm not surprised about, and I don't think you will be either. But it, it shows for for the way we are evolved for this nutrient dense diet, we, we've certainly fallen away from that, and obesity is a reflection of it. Um, but that I thought was an elegant point, especially when you look at America's protein into animal protein intake. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose you've got to factor in there the bioavailability of that plant-based protein. So if, unless you're eating um, maybe uh, the, the, the soy protein powder, which has got its own other issues, the, the, the plant-based protein, you have to subtract a significant factor um, because that's not bioavailable. And then it's really hard to get you have to eat a lot more calories to get yes. the same amount of grams of protein so it's it's 
I think it's possible, but it's incredibly difficult without being incredibly intentional. It's hard for people on an omnivorous diet to get enough protein, let alone people on a on a vegetarian or yes. purely plant-based diet. And plant-based triggers the hell out of me because you know, what's plant-based? It could be um, broccoli and spinach and, and, and those really nutrient-dense per-calorie foods, or it could just be oil and, and, and sugar and refined grains, which is what most people's plant-based diet actually looks like. So I think it's just a, a useless term. But anyway, um, a, a enough banging on about that. But the flip side of um, protein, for, especially for the um, carnivore community, is fat. And um, this is the other side. Basically, uh, for a long time, I believed that you know, eat fat to satiety and just trust that. And But when I did the numbers, found that a higher percentage of fat just leads basically to a, a high intake once you remove the protein it, it leads to more calorie intake so um you posted this cool um paper where it talked about you know it's known that diets having more than 50 percent of the calories from one protein can lead to a negative energy balance which is effectively a good thing which is what we want to do protein leverage satiety um and then talks about rabbit starvation and talks about the in the past we were fat hunters and, and i think a lot of people go yeah well paleolithic man was a fat hunter and chased down the fat woolly mammoth and that's what we should do now but you know i just wanted to unpack the context of how do you decide whether you need to chase a little bit more fat or a little bit more protein in terms of percentage in your diet how do you balance those competing goals based on your current context? Uh, good question, Marty. I mean, the the point that I've always made is energy needs to be to be um, managed according to your activity levels, mm. uh, and potentially age. Um, you know, as children, you know, up until the age of 12 or 13, where the brains are still developing, they're high energy um, and they require a lot of energy and you just need to mm. look at the way kids behave and the way kids eat to know that their brain's calling for energy. Um, so that they're, they're, they're growing kid eat uh, as a study and go, wow, I'm understanding so much about satiety and nutrition as yeah. you watch your growing teenagers plow through the fridge and which yes. food drive them to overeat and yes. yeah, fascinating yes. to experiment as a parent. That's right. Now, like you, just to touch on that point, a lot of these kids now that they, they've got that craving for for energy. Um, however, they're surrounded by this really poor, poor food environment, refined food environment. That, that's part of the reason we're starting to see this um, obesity epidemic amongst kids. But going back to the original point, energy has to be managed in in relation to your activity levels. I, I think protein is non negotiable. Um, simply the building block for life, whether it's coming from animals or, or, or uh, plants. Of mm. course, as you pointed out, far more efficient if it's coming from animal, also probably mm. more micronutrient rich. Mm. Uh, so uh, with regards to carbohydrate and fat, I don't, I'm not particularly fussed where the energy source comes from, uh, mm. whether it's carbohydrate or fat. It just needs to be balanced in relation to activity levels. And, and for a lot of people that carry body fat, that's stored energy. Um, and and perhaps they should be utilising that, you know, yeah. and that's the point I made. So this is where this concept of fasting, in addition with a high-protein diet, is brilliant. Um, with anything that is a caloric uh, deficit, of course, in a sense, it is a high-fat diet because mm. you're liberating your own fat stores. Uh, there's very little reason to overeat fat um, to reach satiety. Where I think it is potentially beneficial, and we might disagree on this, um, Marty, is I, I think if we can steer people away from refined fats like cheeses mm. and butters and oils versus the fat that's actually coming from animals, mm. and if mm. you can eat fat, animal fat with animal protein, I think those two provide a an extremely high level of uh, satiety. I, I don't think there's been any studies done on it. Just a personal perspective that I've. Uh, mm. I've yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I suppose keto has all been about adding more fat to get yeah. high ketones, and I don't think I was definitely in that understanding. But through looking at the data, um, 
no longer believe that but you i think you had a meme that going i, I never understood this um chasing ketones and eating butter to elevate your ketones just for the sake of it believing that it's a health promoting activity so yeah definitely um definitely agree there that that you know that, that the fat that comes with the protein is typically enough for most sedentary people to to get the energy they need and and just you know dialing up the protein percentage and down the fat and carbs will help you but i suppose we gravitate to the fat and carbs all the time and it's just irresistible and like every time i know i when i pro, pro, try to prioritize protein earlier in the day you, you you naturally gravitate to those fat and carbs you're craving the extra energy to top up and that's what you have to limit it's not trying to limit protein or or chase more fat you know your appetite naturally just gives you it makes you seek out that food just for survival um so it's, it's definitely a matter of getting adequate protein and dialing back to fat and carbs so um absolutely, absolutely. so um nutrient density I, I i just love hearing you continually talk about the importance and centrality of nutrient density and, and definitely a passion of mine as well um how did you come to the view that nutrients was the central parameter in, in what's missing in our, in our dietary system at the moment marty i think obesity is made out to be an issue of willpower and gluttony and sloth i think that i completely disagree with it i think one of the most elegant hypotheses generated um in nutrition is the protein leverage hypotheses mm -hmm. i think um uh, I think it, it, it's, um, it, it basically encompasses and, and, and showcases why we have obesity. The, the thing is, we're, we're, fairly, we're fairly primitive creatures and, and appetite is appetite and an enjoyment from food. These are all primitive instincts. Now, the, the body will always crave. Um, the body will always crave. And once we provide the nutrients, we've got some pretty elegant mechanisms in our hypothalamus deep deep in our uh, central nervous system that that can sense nutrients these are nutrient sensing pathways and, and mm. this is why you know in the wild obesity very rarely exists because animals will just eat to their protein target whether it's coming from grass or, or, or other animals they will just eat to the protein target and they won't tend to overeat now we don't do that um, and and i think protein is the most important nutrient that we should be obtaining. But the beauty of animal protein, this is why I tend to gravitate towards animal protein, it has got more bioavailable micronutrients mm. and vitamins as well, locked in. Mm. Um, and, 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 and this is the way I look at it. We, we've got elegant centrally sensing pathways. It's, it's not an appetite or a willpower issue. It is simply we're not hitting the targets to allow the central nervous system to say, thank you, I, I, um, I have enough. Um, yeah. this, is, this is the beauty of, of a higher protein diet. It, uh, yeah. You'll start to find those pathways. Yeah, I, I love that, and that's what you see in the data. And uh, we we we're very we think we're cognitive creatures, and that everything happens in our you know um, cerebellum, and that we understand what we're doing. But so much of what we do is really driven by. Our, our lizard brain and our instincts to seek out that energy and when we're in a certain environment it just triggers overeating and binge eating and uh, and protein leverage hypothesis is is definitely protein is definitely the most satiating nutrient amino amino acids are definitely the cornerstone but in our analysis similar to the the protein graph we see the same thing with many of the minerals and uh and vitamins and once you get enough your appetite switches off so that's why we sort of say let's chase all of the harder to find nutrients and getting adequate protein is sort of the cornerstone because protein and nutrient density tie together so well so yeah it's um uh, just fascinating and I, I just hope more awareness comes in the future and more research and, and we'll continue to analyze the data we have to get it out there and share it and i don't know if you talked about publishing one day and we'll see what we can do um to, to continue only so many hours in my spare time as, a, as, as this is a hobby but it's a, just terribly important isn't it to, it is it is and what, you, what you're doing is extremely important yeah and i, I suppose from a nutrient density point of view that that you showed the picture of 
large scale agriculture and, you know, the soils that we're growing our food in um, are just being flooded with um, fossil fuel based fertilizers and enough nitrogen to make them grow quickly and get calories into those foods but the nutrient content is diluted massively so um in that environment we just keep on going give me more food give me more food and we all eat the satiety so it's it's the quality of the food that needs to change um i i love this one um <laughs> it encapsulates your philosophy i think <laughs> it's uh marty it's it's quite evident that you know in the last 50 60 years on some of the analysis done on on plants the nutrient value of these things are diminishing so what we're seeing is this illusion right like where where the broccoli is green it's big it's juicy the mango is big fat juicy things mm -hmm. and it, however the nutrient to carbohydrate ratio is a lot higher mm -hmm. um you, you know sorry the uh, carbohydrate to nutrient ratio has gone up significantly so these things are more carbohydrate um than they ever used to be so it well, looks like broccoli you know, it, ratio as well th that's right yeah that's right so so fundamentally you're consuming more calories with a more nutrient depleted um product and, and, and this is why i tend to gravitate towards animal protein because especially well-raised animal protein it, it, it's a it's a different ball game you know and no single macro nutrient um causes cancer um or things like that or heart disease it's it's really fundamentally what all this comes back down to is over consumption of calories so how can we get the calories down and and nourish our muscles at the same time it's um, so this is why it may come across that i'm sort of not not um not supportive of plant-based eating it's it's just the environment is not adequate um to allow for a plant-based method of way, method of doing it yeah. Um, so I heard you talk about protein, uh, sorry, personal fat threshold and how that's fundamental to our understanding of diabetes and so many other metabolic diseases. Do you just want to unpack that as a doctor? I thought you'd explain that really eloquently. Yeah, sure. Th thanks, Marty. Yeah. But personal fat threshold is an interesting one, and it's something that I'm still trying to understand, and I don't think we completely understand it. Um, I, I think... I think somewhere down the track, it has to link into muscle quality. Um, and I think it, 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 if, if fat is being generated either, either through overconsumption of carbohydrate or direct consumption of fat, um, you have to be able to utilize that as a fuel. Now, as we've already discussed, we're far more sedentary in this modern mm -hmm. world. And so if exercise is not the key, well, you need quality muscle to be able to consume it. Now, why is it that people can have the exact same diet um, and remain lean in their teenage years and, and, their, and their 20s, yet from about that age 30 onwards, the, the, the identical diet can lead to, to weight gain? And people discuss that as a, well, it's a loss of metabolic rate, but I think Fundamentally, what's occurring is loss of muscle, in mm -hmm. particular the quality, fast twitch, energy hungry muscle. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as that occurs, as we progressively lose muscle, we gain fat. Now, once you've got a situation where the energy going in is far greater than the energy going out, you're going to start storing that. And, and the storage occurs in the liver first. And I think that's the the initial point of insult, which then drives up, um, you know, a high insulin uh, state because the liver is a very important um, organ which is involved with energy storage. And then subsequently comes the fatty infiltration into the pancreas as this excess energy is deposited in the pancreas. And I, I just think certain individuals have a different threshold to that. Mm. So those with quality muscle, quality high-grade uh, large warehouses in which to store these fuels that are being being consumed, I think, are largely protected for the for the for the for the vast part. But those with very lean muscle, and I think this is why a lot of the Asian populations become diabetic a lot quicker. I think mm. the muscle quality is different, Marty, mm. uh, and and it's the same with with our Australian Aboriginal population as well. Mm. The, the tendency to become diabetic is a lot quicker. Than, than the Caucasian populations, but I think everything has to do with muscle size and quality. Now, with Caucasians, 
um, you, you'll find a generally larger muscle, uh, so a larger warehouse in which to store it. Whereas with the Asians, they tend to develop that, um, you know, whether that's Indians and Chinese, uh, any of those sort of uh, groups of people, they tend to develop diabetes very quickly with very small levels of obesity. But these mm. are very lean muscle people. Um, there's just very little of that warehouse in which to store the energy. So I think the liver and pancreas gets infiltrated pretty quickly. Yeah, so it seems that uh, some of these um, Islander people, Australian oh. Aborigines, they, they, f they can, after a famine, rebuild their, their fat stores quite quickly and they're very insulin sensitive at that point, but they reach yeah. a limit where their fat stores tap out and say no more, can't keep taking all yeah. this energy, and it just yes. backs up and overflows into the bloodstream and uh, you know, as glucose, ketones, free fatty acids and into all your vital organs and that's the, the basis of metabolic disease, even cancer and, and the like, just that energy toxicity that we need to manage through the only real solution is to tie it back to satiety, which is a matter of, you know, protein leverage and nutrient density. So, you know, the only, as we've talked, you can't manage your appetite. Your appetite is your appetite and you have to change your food quality to, to get there. So I just think that's really fascinating. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Well, Marty, what we do know and some of the imaging studies that have been done are absolutely fascinating is visceral adiposity, which is the fat that accumulates internally, right, mm. not externally, not under your skin, is uh, highly predictive of metabolic syndrome mm. and health. Um, and, and it's very interesting. You can be very lean and tend to have a lot of visceral adiposity. And one of the radiologists that's on social media, Dr. Sean Amara, he's done a few podcasts, he's a fantastic guy, he's an American radiologist. He demonstrates quite elegantly that, um, that, that you can be lean and still carry a lot of visceral fat. Mm. Uh, this concept that they call thin on the outside, yeah. fat on the inside. And I think certain individuals are predisposed to that. And that, that, that I think, is the personal fat threshold, uh, the way I see it. Yeah, yeah, and and you feel like you're you're blessed if you don't have a lot of belly fat on the outside, but sometimes those people are more protected because they can store their energy on on their bum and their belly and their hips on the outside before it taps out and infiltrates your internal organs, which is where it gets really dangerous. So, yeah, and most people often got really great blood sugars and low insulin, even though they're a lot bigger than they want to be. Um, yes, yeah, so, um, a lot of people had questions about about the microbiome, and um, I suppose it's a, it's a hot and confusing topic. And I sort of yeah, interesting to see your point of view. As a lot of people talk about it, is if they know a hell of a lot about it, and they can personalise their diet and sell you a, a diet plan based on you know your firmicutes ratio or, or whatever. Um, how much do we really know about the the microbiome, and, and can you can you how much can you individualize, and how would you individualize a diet based on your gut microbiome profile? There's uh, forty trillion galaxies in the universe, maybe <laughs> about the about the same number of uh, bugs in our in our in our mic in our gut. Um, how much do we know about the universe? Um, you know, uh, very. Literally. Yeah. Very little bugger all, and uh, I think this is this is where we stand on the microbiome. It is certainly a fascinating field, um, and and these these are commensal organisms. Uh, we give them uh, we give them a a home in which to exist, and and in turn they provide us with with many benefits. But at the moment, it, it is certainly it's certainly evident that that the microbiome is not healthy now. What constitutes a healthy microbiome? I don't know, Marty, but, but what I tend to tell people is that which makes you physically, mentally, reproductively successful is probably the right microbiome. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's it, about as much as we really know, isn't it? That's, that's about how, how much we know. Uh, fecal transplants. <laughs> what's that? Sorry, Marty. And this this knowledge is your full time job as a day, uh, as a doctor. You're not a you're not a in, you're not just an Instagram uh, warrior. <laughs> yeah, no, that, thank you, mate. I, look, I, I, I 
the microbiome, it's, it's, I'm fascinated with it, but the more I read, the more confused I get. And um, this is why I tend, to, I tend to be very wary of anyone trying to sell a supplement that is somehow going to improve your microbiome. I think it, a lot of it's about what we take away uh, from our microbiome. Now, it's very interesting, like you, you take away little bits of knowledge, you know, kids that grow up around large animals like cows and goats and big dogs, um, uh, versus small dogs, I'm not sure why the reason is, but, but they tend to have less allergies. And, um, you know, it, it, you, you, if, when you're living close contact with these sort of animals, generally you tend to exchange microbiome mm. uh, with them. And, and so to me, it's not about purely food, it's about the microbiome is kind of a gateway or a sensing part of, to the environment. It somehow connects us to the environment. Right. The problem is we live in a chemically modified environment with these with these refined foods. So it's no surprise to me that the microbiome struggles. Um, mm. And you, know, you, you look at the studies that have been done on the Hasta and the African um, uh, savannas in, in Tanzania. They've got a very diverse microbiome. Not mm. not because they're eating, um, you know, not because they're having probiotics. It's simply they their microbiome is exposed to an environment the way we were built to be exposed yeah. to the soil, to other animals, to, to, to just a variety of factors in the environment. Yeah, I get a lot of questions about, there was a study a while back in Israel where they tested different microbiomes and different blood sugar responses to different foods and people were saying it's just random and you need to pay us to, to design a diet that fits your microbiome to control your blood sugar but i like mentally i think you know let's just look at your waist to height ratio and yeah. that can guide your food choices if if you're got a lot of um adiposity obesity then and your blood sugars are high then let's dial back the carbohydrate and focus on nutrient density if uh if you're insulin sensitive then let's just focus on satiety and nutrient density and everything else will, will work itself out. I just think, you know, there's so much data and so much, I'm, a, I'm an engineer and I love data, but I realise at the same time that too much data confuses the hell out of me and I, I, I dig numbers, but uh, if I think most people just need much more simplicity. So um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of fibre, what do you find? Um, you, you, you're uh, skeptical on fiber and find that as a gastroenterologist, a lot of people need less fiber in their diet. Look, the, 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 the fiber is a confusing thing, Marty. And I'm not anti fiber, I'm just I just think there's more work that needs to be done in a situation where you're comparing the standard Australian diet, which is you know, your pizzas, burgers, chips, fries, and fast foods versus a diet that is extremely rich in fiber, whole grains, fiber rich cereals, um, vegetables, so forth. Uh, of course, this diet's going to look better. Um, mm. Data wise, it, it is clearly better. It's clearly better. The question is, is it is it optimal? Is it mm. optimal? And I'm all about optimizing it. I'm sure you are as well. <laughs> um, yeah, no pun intended, mate. The, the issue with fiber is, I'm not sure if the modern day microbiome is set up to properly utilize it. The, the role of fiber and the way people look at it is the fiber scrubbing my insides, cleaning me out and providing me with a large bowel motion, right? Mm. That's not the way I, I view it. Fiber is a non-absorbable carbohydrate. It has zero nutrient or caloric mm. value when it exists in the gut. Where it's beneficial is once it's in the cecum, which is the right side of the colon, the bacteria in your hind gut, and this is where all the, 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 the microbiome and most of the microbiome exists, they, they love that, especially if you've got a good quality fiber, you know, there's insoluble versus soluble. These, fiber, these bugs will basically, they'll ferment these, these fibers to liberate short chain fatty acids, which is a form of ketone that the colonocytes and the enterocytes, the cells of line our gut, they love that, okay? And so the butyrate that is generated is absorbed by the colonocytes, which are the cells lining the cecum mm. and utilized as a fuel. They, they, that is their preferred choice of fuel. It's also anti-inflammatory uh, molecule and it's been shown to be efficacious in the setting of uh, things like inflammatory bowel diseases. 
a higher fiber diets more protective and some now what we're fundamentally using the fiber to generate is a fat it's a ketone mm. right and so whilst our primate cousins and, and ruminant animals they've got these big thick machineries which allow them and a large seeking which allows all of this we've along the way in this 4.4 years of uh, million years of, uh, of evolving from from an ape-like ancestor to where we are now we we've our colon is very thin extremely thin um extremely mm. short the cecum is not as large as our primate cousins and, and and that is a very clear sign that we've gone from this fruit eating ancestor fruit and leaf eating ancestor to something that is very different we still carry with us the ability to we're very flexible as humans we'll adapt to mm. any situation right but i'm not sure that we're optimized for it okay mm. and and the point that i've made and not to get too granular on this, is butyrate is, is a fuel or a ketone that can be liberated from fibres, but the breakdown of your own fat generates something very similar, which is beta-hydroxybutyrate. Mm. Now, beta-hydroxybutyrate goes up in multiples above what you can ever ferment in your colon. Does that make sense? Yeah, from, from your own fat stores being... From your own fat stores, in your own serum, and you can perfuse your colonocytes and your enterocytes through your own bloodstream and blood vessels rather than doing it directly and locally in that in that right side of the colon. It is important to step back and say, well, what else is the byproduct of fermentation? The other byproduct is methane. It is hydrogen, right? And nitrogen. Now these gases are, I mean, the vast majority of my practice is made up of bloating, people that are chronically bloated, yeah. right? And, and it shows you that perhaps we are over-consuming um, specific fibres. In addition, we're definitely consuming carbohydrates that cannot be absorbed because they are treated the exact same way as fibre is. They get sent down to the colon. Yep. I can't absorb this, say, it's the small bowel. Dump down there, bacteria move in, they ferment it. These non-absorbable carbohydrates, excessive fructose, fructans found in found in garlic, onion, cereals, grains, uh, polyols found in nuts and cauliflower and things like this and many more. Mm. Uh, and, and so a lot of people will tell me like after dinner, they're sitting there watching TV in a quiet room, they can hear their gut tingling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is their gut, their small bowel moving, contracting quickly because these things can't be absorbed. And the wife goes, what did, what did you eat? Can you stop eating whatever you just ate? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's the methane hydrogen and nitrogen. Yeah, yeah. My um, my wife is much happier since I backed off the the things that uh, created methane in my gut. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so you find some people benefit by backing off on on the yeah fiber, excess fermentable carbohydrates. Yeah. Look, I, I've always made the point: you've got to burn fat, not not sugar. Mm. I think mm. you're much better off burning fat. Um, if you're an elite athlete, explosive exercises, well, that's a different story. The, the benefits of burning fat um, for a primary fuel um, is that you're, you're nourishing your gut um, quite well. I think the brain benefits from a, level, a low level of ketosis, and I think just generally um, the body is, ha body's, um, body is happier. So uh, I think there's a more efficient way to generate that fat um uh, rather than fermenting fiber i'm not i'm not anti-fiber and I, I still have fiber in my own diet mm. uh, but i'm just not certain that it's the most efficient way um so there was this one um you said nothing to see here move along um just the the, the increase in different autoimmune challenges and i suppose that comes down to a an intestinal permeability potentially yeah. as a as a major cause that the things we eat just assimilate more indiscreetly through our gut um, and we don't deal with those and they trigger an autoimmune response and with a, a wife who's type 1 diabetic I'm fascinated by this but uh, it, it's how do we how do we manage it what what's what's the issue here and and, and how do we improve the situation yeah, and this is fascinating, Marty, and this is probably one of my primary areas of, of interest. Like we said, the protein leverage hypothesis 
beautifully ties in with the modern day obesity epidemic. I think the intestinal permeability uh, or what's colloquially known as leaky gut um, ties in beautifully with, with autoimmunity. Um, the biggest interface between environment and us is our gut mm. um, and our skin, of course, but the skin is an impermeable uh, barrier um, full of uh, fibrous, uh, full of tissue that won't allow the external environment to communicate with it. But the gut is a single cell layer um, full of, uh, you know, full of absorptive capacity, mucus. The issue with the modern day gut is that it is, instead of being this tight junctions that, that, that control exposure to the environment, we've got a situation where the intestinal layer is wide open. And so what you've got is environment communicating directly with bloodstream. Um, uh, if that makes sense now, what can occur is bacterial toxins, chemical-based toxins, and there's a lot of talk about glyphosate and its role. Mm. And I'm fascinated with that. In yeah, addition, I think the hypothesis there is that the glyphosate has the negative effect it has in, is killing a positive gut bacteria potentially and, and creating a less diverse ecosystem. Yeah, that's right. And whether there's direct communication into the bloodstream because, you know, the, the, the intestinal barrier is just wide open. It's just not this fortress that it's supposed to be. And so what we're, what we're getting is antigens ending up in things like synovial tissue crossing the blood-brain barrier. And it's fascinating that, that Parkinson's disease, they tie it in, in, in as a compromised blood-brain barrier as well as a compromised um, intestinal um, a layer and I think most of that most of these diseases you could tie into that um, mm. and they're all autoimmune by nature and you can see the trend there there is just this unregulated explosion upwards and the issue with modern healthcare and this is why I whilst I understand these drugs do help people what modern healthcare is doing is with the advent of these new biologic drugs they're just finding ways to block the inflammatory cascade that subsequently develops once the damage has occurred. So you're always sort of um, plugging plugging a hole. You're not mm. addressing the fundamental problem. So I think that, that requires a lot of study. I, I think when people talk about microbiome, I'm less concerned with that. I'm more concerned about well, the permeability of the intestines. It's just the problem is there's no great way to measure it. Um, there are some tests available mm. that are validated. So if you were going to proactively, preemptively manage it, what would you recommend your patients do? Not that you're a doctor on the internet, but... Yeah, <laughs> it's difficult matter because, again, this is an infant, this is a field in its infancy, but some of the mm. factors that, that I, it was a journal that I looked at, um, I might have put something up a couple of weeks ago, but some of the factors that they think negatively affect the, um, the permeability is glided, the wheat-based protein, um, and, and I've got no doubt that that is tied in with a lot of immunological issues mm. that, that are that are not only celiac disease, right? Yeah, yeah. and it's uh, also one of the more nutrient poor foods you could choose. That the processed wheats are also low satiety, low nutrient density, and aggravating. You know, and and, and at the bottom of the food pyramid that we're recommended to eat. <laughs> 100%, and yeah, that's the, one of the biggest flaws in that food pyramid. So we've got gliadin slash gluten, um, which, which are thought to adversely impact the um, tight junctions. We've got ethanol. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't like to hear that. You know, what's a good drink, doctor? I say water. Um, you know, it, it, it's uh, Ethanol is an issue. I've got no doubt of that. You know, uh, people drink it. Your alcohol intake if you want to manage your gut permeability. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, you know, a lot of people drinking red wine for cancer and heart disease prevention. I can, I can assure you that that stuff's contributed more to heart disease and cancer than uh, abstaining has, right? You know, it's again, and if you look at it from an engineer's perspective, it's more, or a numbers perspective, it is just more calories um, mm. to a person that probably doesn't require it. So ethanol is another fact that the emulsifiers in our foods are thought to be problematic. Um, and what, here's an interesting one. Fructose um, is, it tends to energy deplete the enterocytes and drops ATP. Uh, yeah. So fructose is a very interesting one. And, 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 you know, we can touch on it perhaps at a later time, but we all carry with us a fructose threshold. We're not very good at absorbing it. Right. Wow. So, and the fructose threshold varies 
Um, but I think the fructose in itself also is an issue for, um, for intestinal permeability. So what happens when you get too much fructose in your diet? You, you, your gut can't limit the amount of uh, outside bodies that come in through the gut into your system at that point? Yeah, well, a lot of it you'll malabsorb, dump into the cecum for the bacteria to ferment, right? But the fructose that is absorbed excessively depletes intracellular ATP, which is the energy. Wow. Yeah, so which then leads to compromised gut health because you've got an energy-starved cell. Wow. So where do you see this whole field going in the next 10 years or so and, uh, you know, the field of gastroenterology and what are you hoping for in the future? It's, I'm not sure, Marty. I worry about the future because we, we, we've, hmm. got, we've got a situation whereby prevention is not, is not you know, it's not profitable. Wow. Right. You know, it, it, sadly, it's not profitable. So you've got people on the fringe like you, me and, and many others that, that are sort of shouting this message on the sideline. But meanwhile, the, the drug companies keep coming out with these, these fancy new drugs um, when we're not addressing the fundamentals. Right? Mm -hmm. Like you look at healthcare and where it's progressed, it is a very drug based approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the preventative method, the message that you're, you're trying to send it is not widely um, uh, utilised. But then you look at these corporations like Google, Apple, uh, Tesla, they continue to make some amazing strides forward. Why is that? Because they're profitable. They're, they're companies, they're corporations. Whereas in health, the bit that makes it profitable really is the drugs and the surgeries and the prosthetics. So I'm not sure, Marty. I'm, I'm cynical about the future and um, not all that positive, but hopefully true science emerges. I suppose for the people who want to be helped and want to choose the preventative approach, it's you know, I, you can help the people who want to be helped and provide a clear way that works based on what we do know that will help those people. Um, so what's your favourite food and why is it kangaroo? <laughs> Yeah, you, you put that in my mouth, buddy. <laughs> Kangaroo, um, if I had to choose a protein that, that was had it all, it, it certainly would be kangaroo. Is it my favourite food? I can't, I can't hand on heart say that it is, mate. Uh, nothing, nothing tickles my fancy more than a, a steak, um, a good quality grass-fed steak. I love the Tasmanian stuff from Great Cape Grimm. Yeah. Uh, but you look at it, it probably reflects why I don't have a body like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I dug out, um, it was pretty weird to find kangaroo in the shops and I started eating it and then I did some research on the nutrient density and the, it, it's not in chronometer, but the nutrient density profile is just off the chart. And then I looked, you know, you look at alligator and, and you know, these other game meats and the nutrient density is way more than what we see in our, our modern industrial beef system so you can just imagine what what these guys would have been eating yeah 500 years ago that was incredibly nutritious yes. because everything in the environment was eating the things that were nutritious and and those minerals and vitamins just you know saturating and and, and you know they didn't need to worry about nutrient optimizer and nutrient density because everything they could find to eat was just packed full of all the nutrients they need but these days it's it's completely reversed and we need to chase nutrients um, yes. intentionally yes absolutely With, it'd be it'd be interesting to see your perspective on on grass-fed a pure grass-fed cattle marty uh, versus the grain fed because there's a lot of uh, debate about that uh, on the um, especially on the internet yeah yeah uh I'm really fascinated by, I think you are too, with the regenerative agriculture um, approach and anything that's grown in an ecosystem that has plants and animals together is good for the environment and good for the plants and animals and, and the people that may eat them as well. So anything that uh, was a was the movie Biggest Littlest Farm, I don't know whether you've seen it, but it was the story of these people that started this regenerative farm and what they went through and just the beauty and vibrancy and the, it was just wonderfully filmed and you could see visually 
how a vibrant ecosystem looked and how that would contribute to the the, the plant and animal based food that came from that farm and how radically different it would be to these you know massive cropping systems that are just grown for speed and, and profit rather than um, taste and nutrition and, and food quality so i think anything that creates nutrient density through a vibrant ecosystem where everything's happy and singing and the birds are flying around and the animals are thriving um is going to be good for us and good for the environment so yeah I, but but when you look from a micronutrient profile of the grass versus grain it's hard to tell but i think um ah uh, Coherent nourishment. There's some interesting, fascinating research into you know regenerative agriculture-based foods and how they benefit us. Um, but again, still in its infancy, and I hope more people dive into that. Um, yeah. So, what what does Pran eat on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I, I kind of when I'm hungry, uh, Marty. I've, I've got to manage um, my energy. I, I do do a fair bit of weights and, 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 and things like that. So I I tend to gravitate towards beef and lamb uh, yep. and kangaroo when I can find it. It's not as easy to obtain here in, um, in Sydney. I really struggle with it. Um, I try and get a bit of deer in my diet as well. There's a great company called Fair Game Venison that, that will deliver it um, to your door, frozen. Um, but my diet generally tends to, to be beef and lamb. I tend to steer clear of poultry. I find it to be probably not as nutrient rich yep. um, as, as the red meats. And um, I eat a lot of eggs, uh, Marty. Steak and eggs is it's kind of my staple. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that's where you get your, your fat for your energy to replenish yeah. after the workout. So, yeah, that, that's the interesting thing for me when I you know prioritise protein. You go, okay, the body's you do a massive weights workout your body just goes, give me give me fat or carbs now to, to replenish it. that so you have to just listen to your body give it what it needs when it needs it but try not to overdo it and you know donuts are probably not the um best source of that energy but it'll replenish yeah, quickly that's exactly, right. that's exactly right yeah um got a whole ton of comments and questions you might want to jump in later and to the chat thread and, and add some more um, coming up on an hour. But um, so where can people get in contact with you? I think you're um, a consultant at the hospital, but also you've got your own private practice. That, do you do online stuff as well as in person? It, it's hard uh, to do online. I do I do, do a little bit, Marty. I've had a lot of requests for it, but uh, a lot of my work um, and my job entails colonoscopies. <laughs> 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 I can back to a virtual colonoscopy, unfortunately, but um, yeah, it, uh, I do do a little bit of online work. I'm pro I mean, people consider me a low carbohydrate doctor, but I'm just a gastroenterologist, and I just try and you know give these people give, give my clients general advice. So yeah, I'm in Castle Hill, and most of my work is private practice. I'm, I do very little work in the public system uh, now. Cool, cool, okay. Um, thanks so much. I recommend everybody check you out on Insta for a for a good laugh and a, and a intellectually stimulating dietary discussion at the same time, which is a great thing you've done there. And um, thanks for all your support and your friendship and a great chat and lots of great comments that people loved it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, hopefully we can do it again sometime. I'd love to do it yeah. again. Keep in touch. Thanks, buddy. Definitely. Take care, mate.